We're going to continue in Genesis. This week is Genesis 22, the sacrifice of who? Isaac. Next week, I believe Jason's not in here right now. I was going to say Jason. I think Jason will be preaching on the death of Sarah. And then we're going to get into Isaac and Rebekah in chapter 24 and find out some dysfunctional families and figure out how we can... Not that you're all dysfunctional, but we're going to kind of go through some just in case you step into the dysfunction. Um, it's where it starts. So Abraham being tested uh, with Isaac, chapter 22 of Genesis, if you're kind and you're able. <laughs> it's only if you're kind. If you're able to stand with us, please find Genesis chapter 22. Stand to your feet. We will read it together in honor of the Lord as we stand. We'll read all the way down until yeah, verse 18. All right, Genesis chapter 22 in God's word. If you're there, say amen. 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 The word of God begins sometime later. God tested Abraham. Let's just say that again. Sometime later, God, there you go, tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Hmm. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up, I'm sure he did, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, well, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Let's stop there. Jehovah Jireh, the, word, the Lord will provide. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open up the bread of life and just to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear that we would not just be hearers of the word, but actual doers of the word. Father, I thank you for the examples that we see in Scripture from your saints who have walked so close with you that we can understand what it truly means to walk by faith, trusting solely in your purpose, your wisdom, and your plan. Father, help us now to just hear what you have for us. Holy Spirit, guide this time for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? All right, just making sure it's working. What's that? Long gone, okay. Can you hear me now? Long gone commercial. Don't forget, after service, we have Dine with the Pastors, if you're interested in learning more about the church. 
in the Family Life Center. All right, the test of Abraham. It's interesting because now we have some time has passed. Many years have gone by. Abraham and Sarah have probably settled into a more structured house. No longer are they traveling to and fro with tents, going here and there. They now have this child, the child of the promise. His name is Isaac, which means laughter. God has brought laughter to the family. They bore this child in their old age, 100 years old, 90 years old. I don't know if I'm ever going to have a kid if I even make it to 100 years old. I don't know. Maybe we will, but I don't know. So here they are. They're watching young Isaac grow into a nice young man, broad shoulders, probably getting some muscles helping out around the house, watching the family and their faith journey, and they're just enjoying it. Now it's just time to ah, settle into the Christian bliss of everything just works out. It's smooth as glass. There are no waves in life. God requires nothing more of us because, you know what, he's given us what he promised us, and we have it. Let's just wrap our arms around little Isaac and just, you know, encourage him and tell him, He's the best. He's never going to lose at anything because we're going to play sports where you don't have to keep score because we don't want you to feel bad. We love you so much. We're never going to let go of you. Nothing's going to hurt you. We're not going to let you fall down and bump your head. Is that how it is? (laughs) Nah. That's how we want it to be. That's how we live. God's given us something, and now it's, it's our possession, and we hold on to it dearly. But then this comes. God says, take your son, your one and only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. Why, oh why, Abraham must have thought. Give up the child of the promise. You've got to be kidding me. Why? Now? But look, he's such a young, strapping young man. He's growing. He's strong. He's handsome. He's going to make somebody a wonderful husband. Why? Now. Why would God rip something that he promised from Abraham? Why would he rip it right out of his arm? Think about it. Isn't there the tendency of each of us in this room to love the blessing of God, the family that God has provided us, the provision that God has allowed to come our way, that magnifies and completes His promise? Aren't we prone to begin to love that more then we love the giver. <laughs> oh, Isaac is wonderful. He's going to he's going to come up with a cure for cancer. We promote our children everywhere we go. My child would never do that. I can't believe that, you know, that London did that. My child never do something like that. They are way beyond that. They're faith followers. They are children of God. They love God. They don't love this world. We promote our children in every circle that we find ourselves in, trying to convince other people that our child is this wonderful, magnificent design of God that will never backslide, fall into any trappings of this world. And we love them, and we know them better than anybody. We know the inside and out, like the back of our hand. We know our child. You don't know nobody, right? But we tend to start loving the things that God gives us or the things that the Lord entrusts us with more than we love the Father. And so here we see a test coming to Abraham. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. It's funny because we don't want the test in life. But if you are a follower of God, you'll notice that Abraham goes in and out of testing. We will go in and out of testing, Valerie, all our life until we breathe our last because God is making us complete through these trials, through these tests. This is how God grows us. Nobody sits on that smooth lake in a boat going nowhere. God takes us from mountaintop to valley, mountaintop to valley, refining our faith as a furnace does the gold. I didn't sign up for that. Well, you know what? Sorry, yes, you did. 
when you came into the family of God, God will refine you in your faith by bringing trials and tests your way. Abraham being tempted here to love his child more than he would love the Lord is now given a test. Would you love the Lord still the same if he took your child away? Would you, still, would you love the Lord if he took your job away or caused you to go to a third world country making 15 cents an hour? Would you love the Lord if he called one of your children across the pond on a missionary journey for the rest of their lives in a world that is more dangerous, maybe cannibals, unreached people groups that don't understand the culture of Christianity. Would you still love the Lord if he called your child off into an indigenous land that doesn't know the gospel that's dangerous around every corner? That's the question you have to ask yourself. What if God took away the things that you hold dear to your heart? Would you still love the Lord? That's something you have to answer between you and God. But this is why we need to be tested. God wants to make sure that our affections and our attentions are solely towards Him. In light of what He gives us, we still operate here on earth, right? We still operate in our sphere of influence. We still have the things that support us. But God wants to make sure that you love Him and will obey Him. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands, right? But you don't know what you would do in that situation. You have to think here, Abraham didn't wake up and his child was dead. Abraham is being called to go sacrifice his child. And because we don't know what we would ultimately do, because it's a lot easier, is it not, to say, yes, Lord, I will do that. It's a lot easier to say yes when you read the scriptures. It's a lot easier to verbally affirm something without putting the feet into action, is it not? It's a whole nother game when you have to actually let something go, give something up, say no, and actually walk in what you are verbalizing. And that, my friend, speaks volumes about your faith. This is where Abraham is. Offer up your child, your one and all, the child of the promise. Offer him up, Abraham, now. Hmm. You see, he didn't just walk into waking up one day and going, oh my gosh, now, I, now I've got to deal with this, Isaac's dead. No, he is now going to be the instrument which listens and obeys the Lord and does what God says. But he's going to do it 100%, showing that he is a faith follower and that he trusts in the Lord. And this is what James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 2. Through four, consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of varying degree. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. See, God is trying to make us complete. And so we must encounter trials throughout our journey with God. We must. The fallacy of I come to Jesus and he fixes everything like that, it's, it, that, that, that's a sham. That's a five and dime prophecy. That's a book that sells for 99 cents at Dollar General. God is always bringing us through trials to refine us that we might grow in our faith and our obedience to the Lord. This produces the kind of person that is called a Christian. This is our life. Faith is built on the anvil of pain. He refines us. He shapes us. He molds us. And he makes us. And so we have to understand that sometime later God tested Abraham. 
and it says tested Abraham. And so we have to understand that these tests are personal. These tests are for us. It doesn't say that, that sometime later God tested Abraham and Sarah. This was specifically a personal test to develop the father of faith, Abraham. Abraham didn't go get a committee together. He didn't go ask his friends what they thought about it, what he should do. He didn't go ask his mom. He didn't go ask his uncle. He didn't go ask the, the co-worker. He just understood this is a test that is personal to me. I must deal with this. And there are some things that you have to walk through by yourself because God is refining you and you alone will benefit from it. It doesn't matter what your spouse says. It doesn't matter what your friend says. It only matters what God is telling you to do. And Abraham hears the word of God and he immediately responds in action. He doesn't sit down and go, hmm, let me just figure this one out. He doesn't try to figure it out. He doesn't try to make A plus B equals C. He doesn't try to make it work out in 30 minutes like on TV. He just listens to what the Lord has for him as he is spending time hearing him. And he says, God has said to do this. Therefore, what does he think in his heart as a follower of God? He says, wow, what God says to do, I must think about. What God says to do, I'm going to argue and debate. What God says to do, I must figure out. No, he says, what God says to do, even though I can't wrap my mind around it, even though I don't understand it, if I don't understand it, walking with the Lord this long, certainly Sarah's not going to understand. So I better not go, what God says to do, I am going to do. That's what a follower of God does. That's how we live. Thank you, Carter. Carter agrees. But that's how we should operate. We don't, we don't look at, well, am I going to benefit from this? Is this going to make me more wealthier? Is this going to make me more, you know, give me more status in the community? If God says to do something, this is a test coming your way. It's personally designed, developed just for you to grow you and to mature you. Your response should be, yes, Lord. I will do it. And you see, Abraham had a three-day journey. He's going 50-some miles to the region of Moriah. He's got three days to think about this. Three days. Could you imagine? Walking. Okay, Abraham, 100 years old, I, I can't imagine this. He's chopping some wood first. So Abraham chops some wood, and he loads up. He grabs his servants, he's got the donkey, he's got his son, he loads up the chopped up wood, and he sets off to a place in just a region for three days. He is mulling over, what would you think Abraham is mulling over in his mind for three days as he's walking to sacrifice his child of the promise? What would you think Abraham is thinking? I think Abraham would be thinking, why God? Do you really know what you're doing? Are you a liar? You told me this was the promise. Your promises, you've said, come to pass. You are a God of love. Why would you kill your child of the promise which he gave? Do you think that's what Abraham was thinking? I mean, that's that's would you not would those be some of the questions on your mind how can i get out of this <laughs> there, where 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 is the the rest of the script because this doesn't line up with what i've been told about you god all those things i bet were going through his head right not abraham this is the difference with abraham abraham is walking three days and three days i guarantee you if you had three days with the lord You'd be thinking some things, right? But if you had three days to think, the enemy's going to say, wait a minute, let me, let me just creep in here for a moment. Abraham, what you doing? What, what, what are you doing? You're going to sacrifice your son? Oh, you got to be kidding me. You, and I've tried to tell you all along. You're 100 years old. I've been on your back since day 75. What is wrong with you, okay? It's not going to work. The Lord's a liar. He's a killer. He's a murderer. And you think I'm a liar? Come on now, look. He just told you you're going to have the promise. You're going to have the child. You're going to have many nations come through you. The uh, children, oh yeah, as, as numerous as the, the sands. Look at the stars. Come on, Abraham. You've fallen for a joke. Turn around. Let's go home. Let's have a sip of wine. Let's get drunk. Let's just party because this way, where you're going, that doesn't make sense. 
That's what the enemy would do for three days. Beat down Abraham trying to get him to walk away from obedience to the Lord. The Lord says something, the enemy's going to jump right there and try to tell you for three days why it's not going to work. My mom doesn't agree with me. My dad doesn't. You're right. You're right. You're right, devil. This is, this is just, you're, I need to follow you more often than you know what the Lord, because your way is a lot easier. You actually tell me to like do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's what the enemy does. But Abraham knew that God would provide because he says, we're going to go there and worship, and then we will come back to you. We will, both. Abraham on his three-day journey wasn't brainstorming what he could do. Abraham was brainstorming in the provisions of God. How is God going to fix this one? That's what a man of faith does. When they're presented with a problem or a dilemma, which we can't understand, but we know clearly we heard it from the word of God, which was the will of God. Abraham for three days was probably trying to figure out, man, how is the Lord going to work this one out? He's going to provide through what? You know, Hebrews tells us that Abraham said, even if, I do kill that God's going to resurrect him somehow. So he was, he's even thinking of resurrection even before there was a resurrection of Jesus Christ. Abraham was brainstorming about how God was going to provide because that's what people of faith do. We rely on God fixing the problem, not us. So I don't know how it's going to work out, son. I have no idea. Dad, where's the sacrifice? I don't know, son. You know what? But the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, he will provide. He will provide. So Abraham, not trying to think of how he's going to work him way, his way out of this, this one was wondering how in the world is God going to glorify himself because I know the character of God. I know the promises of God. God's never lied to me. He's always come through. So he's brainstorming all these things. I can imagine him getting excited as he's going to the region of Moriah waiting to be told, here it is. And he's like, yes, I'm going to finally get to see God provide. And so he focuses on the promises, not on his lack of understanding, not on how he is going to get out of the situation. And so this is faith, believing that God will work this seemingly impossible situation for our good, right? So that I'm able to, in spite of my questioning, obey God because God says in his word that he works in all things for the good of those who what love him and are called according to his purposes Abraham is definitely called according to his purposes Abraham just needs to do a few things and here's the deal we always want God to provide for us. Hey, I'm living with my girlfriend. We're not married yet, you know. We're, we're having relationships, and we're going to get married, but I just wish God would open a door for me to get a job. Hmm. I know I'm not living for the Lord. I'm, I'm not right, but you know what? I just, God, I just need a spouse. I need, you know, we always want God to bless us in our disobedience, right? And that's, it's kind of, it's, it's funny how we somehow, we somehow just gloss over the truthfulness of this isn't right, and yet we ask God to bless a situation before we get right in obedience. God's never going to do that. Never going to do that. When did God provide for Abraham? God provided for Abraham when he was in the right place according to God's perfect timing. And he was in the right place because he was listening to the word of God, which is the will of God. Even Jesus in the garden said, Lord, if this, if this cup could pass, I, I really like my wrists and my, and my ankles. If this can pass, please take it. But your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Abraham was in the right place according to the word of God at the right time doing exactly what God said to do. He was in the center of God's will. That is when God provides. Just like Toby Mack says, it might be midnight, midday, never early, but never early late right i've lived enough life to say what help is on the way and so we expect god to bless us and to provide when we're not living right for it. i live with my girlfriend we're gonna get married god just bless me give me a job what seriously 
God provides his provision on time when we are in the center of God's will. Chew that one. I mean, that steak tastes good when you think about it. Because what happens when this takes place? 100% obedience, we get to see God be God. We get to see God manifest the promises to us. How much do we miss out on? Because we're 99.5% obedient to God. God demands 100% obedience to his word, which should be easy for somebody who's walked along with the Lord long enough to see that God doesn't lie. He does provide, and his provisions are always on time. They only come when they are needed. If Abraham would have went to the region of uh, who knows what, Janesville, he'd be in the wrong place. But it was on time. No, it's still the wrong place. Or if you're on time in the wrong, it's, it, it just doesn't work. Abraham had to be in the right place doing what the Lord said to see the provisions of God rain down. That's when the provisions of God come. When we're obedient and doing what the Lord has asked us to do. But then I think, you know, nobody's ever talked about Isaac. Nobody's ever talked about young Isaac. I mean, could you, what, what's Isaac thinking? I mean, he, of course, he's not stupid, right? Um, they got the wood. <laughs> Isaac's probably got a back full of wood. Uh, Abraham's carrying the flint to start the fire. Walking along. Dad, you're going to worship, right? Because obedience to the Lord is an act of worship, by the way. They're going to worship the Lord on the mountain of Moriah in that region. And Isaac's like, Dad, the wood's getting heavy. But I got a question for you. We've been walking for three days. This just dawned on me. Where's the sacrifice? What does Abraham say to him? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, Isaac had enough wherewithal to ask, where is the sacrifice? And here Abraham just says, hey, son... God will provide the sacrifice. God himself, God himself will provide the sacrifice. And I, I, I would be like, Dad, you know, if God was going to provide the sacrifice, don't you think we would have woke up in the morning and at the foot of the bed would have been a cat, a dog, a cow, a goat, something to sacrifice, a chicken for all I know. What are you telling me? God will provide, son. And you notice that's it. That's it. And they go to this region and they build this fire. And guess who gets on top of it? Guess who, or who gets, gets strapped and bound and the wood's put on top and it's, you know, time to plunge a knife in. Light the fire. We've got to burn it after we sacrifice it. It's Isaac. Abraham's 100 years old. Isaac's a young boy. Isaac could have whooped Abraham, right? I mean, there, there could have been some, <laughs> he ain't tying me up, Daddy. Come on. I, you know, I, <laughs> I float like a butterfly. <laughs> I've been teaching myself to sting like a bee, Dad. Back off. None of that. None of that. Isaac fully trusted his father's words that God would provide where where do isaacs like that come from where do isaacs like that get developed in the crucible of where where is that training ground for young isaacs where is that how how did isaac get this trust in his father i'll tell you where it comes from children grow in faith like this by being in families that take their faith seriously Around every corner, Abraham and Sarah, even though they would wax and wane at times, even though Abraham would give up his wife to the kings and lie, even though he would have what we would call adultery with Hagar, Abraham and Sarah followed the Lord and invited him into every situation and obeyed him as best they could. They always said, God will provide, son. 
So Isaac is born into this family, and he watches this model of two people who love the Lord, living for the Lord. It just wasn't tongue-in-cheek. It was actual feet on the ground, action. And so he knew, if my dad says that our Lord, who I have watched over these teen years, provide around every corner, he's going to provide. It doesn't happen in the school system. It doesn't happen in a church building. It happens in the church, the ecclesia, the people of God. It happens in families that are modeling a faith journey themselves, not just talking about it, but putting feet even when it doesn't make sense. Even when you're looking at your kids and going, you know, I don't know where the food's coming. I don't know where I'm going to get a job, but God will provide, son. He is Jehovah Jireh. This is how Isaac was birthed into believing. And so, parents, this screams volumes to us. Are you trusting the Lord? Do you fully believe in your obedience that God will provide for all of your needs? Regardless of how it looks and what you can figure out, you might be a mathematician, you might be a designer, I don't know, but it, do, it might not always work out in your mind, but in God's economy of his kingdom, it will always work out when we are obedient to the Lord, doing his will as we follow his word. Amen? This is how Isaacs are built. And so he's basically telling Abraham, if you let it go, you can have it all. But it's not until the actual act, and it says, when he went to raise his hand to plunge the knife into his son, did the angel of the Lord say, Abraham, Abraham! It wasn't until the, until the right moment when he needed the provision. You see, he would have never got that provision. He would have never seen the Lord work a miraculous working if he had not fully done what he verbalized in his belief in action. So as he does this, the Lord begins to provide. And he says, don't harm the child. And the question is always asked, well, didn't God already know? Because then it says, now I, now I, now, now, now I know. Now I know. Now I know that you fear God. Oh, if we had a little fear for God. Now I know that you fear God. <laughs> because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. See, I don't think that it was God that needed to know fully. Because God knows the beginning from the end, right? That's what the Bible tells us in the Psalms and in Romans. But I think God was trying to show Abraham even in his own journey, that he is capable of doing all that God asks him. And that, my friend, would build Abraham's faith exponentially. Now I know. It's no longer this. It's action. It's words in action. He was willing to totally let go anything that God had given him as far as provision in life, because he trusted and loved God 100%, which led to 100% obedience, and which led to him seeing God manifest himself in ways that only people who obey 100% get to see the Lord manifest himself. And God provides the lamb in the thicket. Isaac's like, I knew he was going to come through. Gets up, they go get the lamb, put it on the altar, and they sacrifice that lamb. And this, my friend, is a picture of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Like Isaac, Jesus faced a sacrificial death at the hands of his own father. Isaac faced a sacrificial death at the hands of his father. Jesus had to carry his own wooden cross beam to Golgotha. Isaac had to carry his own wood to the burnt offering jesus asked his father can this cup pass in the garden isaac questioned his father and said hey where where is the sacrifice that is where my friend it ends because in similarity that's where we stop because then jesus's life takes a different turn the father doesn't stop he isn't stopped the father does crucify his son on the cross 
Jesus was not given a lamb in the thicket. Jesus was the lamb in the thicket. And so what drives Abraham, a sinful man, to follow the Lord? It's a faith journey, and it's by seeing God provide time and time again. But the bigger question is, do you have a lamb in the thicket? Do you have a substitute for your journey to the cross if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ? We all need a substitute. Otherwise, we're going to the cross ourselves. We're going to a literal place called hell to pay the penalties of our sin if we do not have a substitute, a lamb that has taken our sins and has been shed its blood for the remission of sin. Do you have that lamb in your life? That lamb is Jesus Christ. He is the perfect lamb of God. John the baptizer said the very thing. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is the key ingredient to life eternal. Isaac had a lamb. Do you have a lamb? I would say you do. You just have to appropriate what that lamb did on the cross in your life by accepting him by simple faith, putting your trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus I know I'm a sinner. I know you're the Son of God. You stood in my place and took the penalty which I deserved for my sins. I'm aware of my sinfulness. I'm aware that you are the Son of God. Please forgive me of my sins. At that moment, Jesus will change you into a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You are now able to repent, right? Turn away from all that sin and walk a new life with Jesus, towards Jesus, and with Jesus, saying no to sin, rebellion, and being at enmity with the Lord. So can you let it go? There's always something. There's always something in your life that you are not willing to let go that is hindering you from either coming to Jesus, whether it be pride, arrogance, materialism, you think you've built your own kingdom? Can you let it go and fully trust God and come to him for the forgiveness of your sins? If you are a Christian and God is asking you to, for, to let something go, can you obey 100% and watch the blessings of God unleashed in your household, unleashed in your life? Can you? Would you? Will you? Are you willing to do that? Last Thursday, I was meditating on this and in the morning. And God was clearly showing me things in my life, attitudes, thoughts, possessions that needed to go. And it's one thing to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to let it go next week. Let me just use it one more time. Let me just think this way one more time. Let me just say that. No. He said, now. Now. 8.30, I'm wrestling with the Lord. I'm supposed to be at church. Because we all, we all want to rush to work. I was like, i got to go to work. 8.30, I'm late. I mean, you guys get up early, right? 15 seconds, <laughs> out the door to work. That's, don't you love going to work? Right? Okay, 30 seconds. Some ladies have to do their hair. Just get some pomade. You'll be good to go, right? 9 o'clock comes around. I'm still at home wrestling with the Lord on this. 9 o'clock. I'm like, well, if I'm here, I might as well do something. So I pull the laundry out of the dryer, and I start folding clothes. I'm like, Lord, let me go. Let me go. He's like, no, you let it go. And so finally I did. I did a ceremonial sacrifice of things and walked over to the trash can and threw some things out and did what I needed to do. And the Lord's like, good. And I get to work, you're late. <laughs> so, so I got in the car. This is a true story. Got in the car and I come to work and I'm sitting right over there in the parking lot. And the senior adults are gathering for their fun family, their, their fun time. They're doing, uh, I don't know, they're playing games or something. And I'm sitting out there, and I'm actually, I pulled up Amazon real quick, and I had to return something to get that little, you know, QR code for return. And this lady knocks on my window. And I'm like, get out of the car. I'm like, hi. She's like, hi, I'm Sue. I'm like, she's like, am I, in, am I in the right place? I'm like, I don't really know, Sue. Where are you supposed to be? She's like, well, I'm here for games, and I couldn't remember if this is the church or if that's the school and this is the school or that. It's like, I, don't, I just don't know where to go. I said, oh. Got out of the car and started talking to her. And one thing led to the next and she was telling me about her faith journey and she was married to a Catholic and she doesn't really believe in too much. And I said, she's like, my sister's been sharing me about Jesus. And I said, do you know if you're saved? She's like, no, I really don't know if I'm saved. 83-year-old lady. God kept me. Sacrifice.
sacrificing things at home, letting it go, because he had a plan and a purpose that was far greater than what I could imagine or think or understand, and here he's about to use me to affect somebody's life for the kingdom. Five minutes into the gospel conversation, I looked at him and I said, do you want to do that and give your life to the Lord Jesus? He said, absolutely. And so we sat there and we prayed. She stumbled through it. We laughed. We, I led her, and she was overjoyed that she gave her life to the Lord. But unbeknownst to her, God was working on me hours before our divine appointment. Had I have just gotten up and said, yeah, Lord, that's great. I'm going to do that stuff. Whatever you're asking me, I'll do it later. Got in the car, been at work at 830, would have completely missed that opportunity to see God be God. And you know what I got out of that? I got the joy of seeing somebody come from death to life as I knew my Father in Heaven was rejoicing over one repentant sinner. He didn't flood me with money. He didn't flood me with fortune, fame, and status. I was obedient to the Lord, just like you can be. And God will unleash His spiritual blessings in your life guarantee it try the lord one area you can try the lord keep him a man of his word and he will never let you down amen amen let us pray father i thank you for this opportunity just to share what you've done in your kingdom advancement god thank you for the life and the rebirth of sue and i pray father that you would bless that woman in her journey i thank you lord for chuck and annette who are taking her on with discipleship and Lord Jesus, I pray for each of us who have just heard this sermon that we would really, truly contemplate 100% obedience. Father, help us to let go of the things that are holding us back from watching you be who you are, our Lord and Savior. Father, for those who do not know you, I pray that they would let go of the pride that is keeping them from coming to the foot of the cross. Lord Jesus, you know what everyone needs before we even ask. So Father, may your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to stay seated.